see that? Huh. This is Olga Karlin. She is a fencing four-time world champion and Olympic gold medalist. As soon as I stepped out onto that fencing mat, I knew it wasn't gonna go well. I also didn't get the memo about the socks. But let's rewatch that again, and this time, have a look at how fast she's moving. And I say that because fencing is one of the fastest sports in the world. And on the surface, it's kind of hard to follow. It's not very accessible, and you might even question what makes it extreme. And the reason for that goes back centuries, to an age where 30,000 men were killed whilst practicing the discipline. Yet, fencing still continues to thrive and evolve. It has the vision to be like a UFC. Because it's such a captivating sport to watch, if your eyes know what they should be looking for. And it's right here in Italy where the techniques of modern fencing originated. So, of course, we were going to come here. Welcome to Bologna. Welcome to my club called Virtus Kerma yeah. Bologna. One of the best in Italy. And this is the room that you spend most time in? Yes, all the time. Okay. Every day. I was watching a video from the 2012 Olympics oh. and fencing looks, it looks so futuristic with yeah. all the, the lights, but it's a really old sport, like centuries old. Centuries. And those roots are traced back to the development of swordsmanship for duels and self-defense during the 15th century, which is believed to have originated in Spain. Some of the most significant books on fencing were written by Spanish fencers. However, swordplay goes back at least 3,000 years, and it wasn't like we see it in the films. It wasn't choreographed, a lot of soldiers didn't have training, and it wasn't elegant. Historians tell us it was quick bursts of strength to avoid drawn-out conflict, and it was a painful and bloody affair, resulting in the death of the opponent, and in most cases, the victor would have been seriously wounded in the path to victory. But with the development of firearms during the Renaissance, sword fighting became less important in warfare and became more prominent in dueling. Here in Ferrara, it was thriving in the 13th century, but it was a little bit different. It was in alleyways like this, where people used to just fence each other. But this was back in the day before fencing was a proper sport and there was protective equipment. And if you fought someone here in Ferrara and you killed them, that was fine, apparently. And then something happened that would change the sport forever. In France alone, 30,000 men were killed in duels over an 80 year span. Why we have white equipment? It's uh, from all old, old times. You can yeah, see the blood. From like the swords. Yeah. So proper training and the right equipment was a response to the sheer amount of people dying in the sport. And it was then that the fencing masters rose to prominence and this completely changed the conduct of the sport. Fencing changed very fast. Now it's more athletic. It's a lot because we have to train like uh, physically technically, sometimes mentally. You gotta be extremely fast, extremely focused. It's very important reflex, uh, mostly in Sabre. It's super, super fast, extremely fast. To win, you need to score 15 touches. So the one who gets first to 15 wins the game. One point can last sometimes even less than a couple of seconds. Sometimes it's less than one second. But those rules were implemented back in 1896, allowing the art of fencing to become the sport that it is today. But as Miles Shamley Watson puts it, it's a double-edged sword. The implementation of the rules made it more complicated for an audience to follow. No disrespect to bowling, but like if bowling's on the telly, fencing can be on TV. So my goal is to make people understand fencing in the easiest possible way. That will bring a new audience of kids to be like, well, mom, dad, like, what's that? You're like, oh, this is fencing, this is like the World Championship, this is the Olympics. They're like, oh, I wanna do that. You started when you were really young? Yeah, I was 10. I remember my first uh, electric jacket. You can draw your name okay. just by machine. Yeah. We couldn't because oh, it cost okay. some 20 euros or something like this. Yeah. And my mom drew it by herself. It was pretty bad times for mm -hmm. us, but uh, in 14, uh, I earned my first salary. My first salary I, I gave to my mom. Oh, yeah. oh, that's amazing. The more I've watched fencing and started to understand how the jewels work, it's really thrilling. Tomorrow you will try it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We just made it to this fencing school. Look at this room, it's insane.
The building is of 15th century and is of my family from 1878. So the first of family was really a real fighter. His two sons, they lived in the period of transition between the real fighting and the sport. Who could partake in fencing? In that period, only the king, the princess. The weapon was very, very, very expensive. Half of fencing is here. Yeah, yes. The other half is here. Fencing is like to play chess at 200 kilometers an hour. And half a second, you have to decide and realize mm. with this. The command is here. Okay, so we've looked into the history of the sport, we've looked at the different weapons that are used, but I still don't really understand properly how a match works, so... Have we gonna try it? Yeah, I think there's only one like way it. we can do this. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to try this. So you got pants? I got trousers, they're a bit short. <laughs> This is funny part. <laughs> yeah. So once Olga and the team had a good laugh at my expense, it was time for my first lesson. Olga, ready? I tried to show you how is it in real time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it was cool. You're getting better very fast. Just for some context, if you didn't realize how fast Olga can move with her saber, watch this. You did that, right? Yeah. That was you. Yeah, it was me. It's ridiculous. I'm curious to know what, where do you think fencing will be in maybe the next five to 10 years? I hope it's gonna be more fun, it's gonna be more popular. I just suggest to people like to try fencing at least once. Well, I genuinely loved it. That was so fun, I wanted to keep going. So maybe take some lessons and then I come back and we fight again. And I truly meant that, I've started to look at booking lessons in London and the thing is, I don't think I would have ever considered fencing if it wasn't for this opportunity to dive into the origins of the sport and to spend time with Olga and actually get to fence against her. I don't want this to sound like a stereotype that everyone said, but I am living my childhood Star Wars dreams right now. <laughs> These athletes' reflexes are incredible. But the problem is the barrier to entry in fencing is so high. You need a mask, a saber, a jacket, trousers, the wires. You need all these things to just start practicing the sport. Unlike a sport like baseball when all you need is a bat and a glove and a ball and you can just go out into the park and play with your friends. In addition, if there was a way to perhaps bridge the barrier between the audience and the fences and to be able to show the audience watching the tension and the stress that these athletes are going through within each match, perhaps that would make the sport more compelling to watch. I think it has the vision to be really like a UFC. Take like UFC polo and tennis and have a baby. That's my vision for the sport. And perhaps the creativity that is required in a match to defeat your opponent, maybe that could be translated into the broadcast itself, widening fencing's appeal for more people to tune in, watch the sport, understand it, and maybe even take up the discipline itself. Guys, thank you for watching this episode of Origins. Let us know what you think of the sport and where you think it could go in the next five to 10 years. And I'll be back in the next episode. So I'll see you guys then.